Stephen Poacher, looking at um, Kerry from the weekend, they went up to Monaghan, won 17 points to 14, which is no mean feat either. Monaghan are obviously an excellent team. They have five points uh, from six games at this point of the season. Have you been impressed with, with Kerry? So f- well, I mean, obviously there's seven and a half yeah. months in between games, but were you impressed with what you saw by Kerry? Yeah, listen, you know, uh, yeah, as you say, it's, it's, it's what we're looking at so all we have to go on is, is the one game. But one, one thing, Shane, which is very, very interesting and stood out for me was the tactical innovations in Kerry. Uh, you know, and, and we start with, with, with obviously the way they set up, but, but also what they've done with the kick-out, which is very interesting. And, you know, I, I, you, go back, you go back a number of years, Shane, to Kerry, and it was... You know, we're Kerry, we play the one way. You know, I remember Tomas O'Shea did a little thing for me over lockdown with a couple of the club lads and, and it was brilliant insight into him. We, we got a, we got chatting to Tomas one evening about about uh, his days with Kerry and he says, Stevie, he says, like, we used to go up to Crow Park full of confidence, full of arrogance. He says that we were just better than them, you know, and we would just go and play. And he says back in 2000, he told a great story actually, uh, back in 2000 when they won their, the, the All-Ireland in 2000 and Seamus Moynihan was sitting beside him in the chase rooms and he said to him, uh, he says, fuck me, Tomas. He says, uh, we, we could win eight in a row. And uh, he says, Tomas says, three years later, after Armagh had beat them and Tyrone had beat them in the same change rooms, Seamus Miner turned around him and says, Jesus, Tomas, nobody fears us anymore. <laughs> so the, uh, he says, uh, but it, it, it's interesting because Kerry have always had that swagger and they've always had that arrogance that we're better than anyone and we put, we go toe to toe with anyone. But what I've noticed, Shane, now is that tactically they're, they're becoming more tuned in to what you would call the modern game. And I suppose if I look at Baggins' kickouts, so for example, if Baggins kicking the ball out from here, okay, if Baggins kicking the ball out from here, a team that presses Baggins, Baggins get over the top of them. And he'll create a lot of scoring chances for Monaghan by doing that. But interestingly, at the weekend, what Kerry Dunn was, this is Kerry's press, what Kerry Dunn was, they actually dropped off the kickout Okay, to here, they dropped off the kick out, and what they did was they t- they took Baggins' kick out of it, and they allowed Baggins then every time just to choke possession up and give the ball to the corner back. And what it allowed Kerry to do then was actually get themselves defensively organised at the other end. And it was a very interesting play, and it's something that, that obviously a number of weeks ago we would have played Meath in a challenge game at the minor level actually, and Meath the two absolute monsters in the middle of the field, two lads about six foot five. And we seen very clearly after seven or eight minutes that their energy line was the middle, the middle third. Goalkeeper going long, he was causing a serious problem. We were pressing the kick out. So what we decided to do then was simply, okay, drop off, let number four have the kick out, and let him show him down the line. And you know that's shrewd thinking. It's 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 shrewd coaching, and you need to be switched on to those things. Jerome done something very similar at the weekend, Shane, and we'll talk about Donegal in a second. But Jerome done something very similar in the weekend with with Sean Patton's kickouts. They dropped off them. You know, to avoid that big kick over the top that Murphy flicks on, the McHugh's running on to. And I would say that Monaghan, that Dun- or sorry, that Kerry were, were scared that Monaghan would have hurt them on that. And that's one of the reasons why they've done that. But also as well, another reason why they would have done that is, is that Monaghan have a very good running game. They play a very strong counter-attack style of football. So it allowed Kerry to drop in and get organised. And what you found with Kerry at the weekend was, and, and at numerous times, at numerous times, Kerry had 14, 15 behind the ball, at one stage, David Clifford was back doing a shift, you know, and that's a sign of things to come for me. And there's no question about it. And I think Kerry have realised that to play man to man, and you score 24, we'll score 25, is going to win you games. It's going to win you fans, but it's not going to win you all Ireland's. And I think they realise that. When you were watching the Monaghan against Kerry game, did it stand out to you that, like Dublin, wing, industrious wing forwards and pacey wing backs? So we talked about Dublin in in the other segment where. You had Niall Scully and you had Eric Lowndes as the wing forwards, but you had attack-minded Robbie McDade and John Small behind him. But even more so for Kerry, because their wing forwards, uh, Michal Burns and Ronan Buckley, but behind them you had two speedsters in Paul Murphy and Gavin White who were scoring threats. So it's similar to Dublin, but perhaps even with more pace now that Jack McCaffrey isn't involved. Yeah, well, listen, the other thing as well, uh, Shane, four out of Kerry's six defenders scored at the weekend which is a very interesting statistic. Peter Crowley's back playing for them as well. It's good to see him back playing. But on a, on a serious note, Kerry have always possessed brilliant footballers. You know, their cornerbacks have been as skillful and as good a footballer, Shane, as most teams corner forwards. And that's always been the case, you know, and, and going back to old Kerry teams of the past, you would have seen marauding runs from their wing backs, their cornerbacks, and kicking scores with the outside and the inside of their foot. So four out of their six defenders scoring is a very interesting thing because, Shane, in Gaelic football, if you're playing deep, and you're playing a counter-attacking style of football. The dangerous, the dangerous man in all that is the late runner. 
the man who's coming from deep, he's the danger. And if Kerry have those numbers and those footballers coming from deep, the likes of White, as you mentioned, and the likes of Murphy, they can hurt teams. But let's go back to their, their crown jewel, David Clifford. There is no better player in Ireland right now than David Clifford. At the age profile he's at, this guy could be anything he wants. And the reports coming out of Monaghan at the weekend from people I spoke to who were actually at the game, physically at the game, were saying that this kid is sensational. Absolutely sensational. And when you've got that in your armory, and it's a bit like Donny Gall, you know, with Michael Murphy. People said, is, is Michael Murphy one of the best footballers in the country right now? You know, he's probably is, he probably is, and he's probably one of the most flexible. Michael Murphy can play at six, at eight, at nine, at twelve, at eleven, at fourteen. You know, and and he's he will do it, and he's got that mentality that he put a shoulder to the way he put the hits in, but he'll also threaten teams. But this guy Clifford is just something else, Shane. I I I don't know about you, but but I haven't seen anything like the lad, and I, and I just I just think in the next few years he could be an absolute sensation. He could just be he could be one of the greatest skilling footballers that we've ever seen, and that's. That's not an understatement, you know, that's that's reality. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. I've nothing to suggest otherwise. Um, one of the questions about Kerry that I had for you, now they're top of the table, obviously can win the league title this weekend. Do they have any weaknesses in there? Is there any players that Monaghan were able to get after? No, well, I think collectively as a weakness, defensively they're, they, they, they've always been suspect for me. I go back to the goal they conceded against the uh, All Ireland Champions last year, Dublin. I go back to the goal they conceded, Shane, where uh, Jack McCaffrey broke from deep, Brian Hard caught the ball. That came from a full zonal press. Now, Kerry went really after Dublin's kickouts, but they exposed themselves, and they left themselves a little bit exposed. Uh, on their own kickouts, on their own kickouts, it's interesting because Monaghan got a fair bit of joy off Kerry's kickouts at the weekend. Uh, Monaghan pressed Kerry's kickouts, and outside of the of the out ball to David Moore, the long kick out to David Moore, when Monaghan pressed Kerry, Kerry were in a bit of trouble. They were in a bit of trouble and Monaghan got a good bit of joy off it. And that would worry me a little bit, particularly against Donegal or Dublin. Because if Dublin were to press Kerry, or we go back to the game at the weekend where Galway played Mayo, that Mayo press, that was incessant Mayo press, Mayo, Dublin, Donegal have serious physicality around their middle third. And if they were to go after the Kerry kick out, that could cause Kerry problems in the later stages of the championship. Yeah, Dermot O'Connor really impressed me at midfield for Kerry. Like um, David Moore, and so yeah. good on the ball, leader, that type of thing. Like, do, will teams go after him? Is there any sort of a mobility question? He's a little bit older, like he's a huge man. So you'd think that a small dynamic player would be able to sort of trouble him in a one-on-one -on -one situation. A bit like, you know, Aidan O'Shea is unbelievable in so many respects, but like against speed in a one-on-one, -on -one, that's obviously tougher for him because just the sheer size. And he was brilliant, by the way, but just the sheer size. Yeah, well, the counter argument to that is that we're at the time of year where it suits a big man, you know, mm. where the pitches are a little bit heavier. And, you, you know, even even the, the message I got last night about about our own game this, that was going ahead this weekend in Brewster Park, someone said to me, you know, Stevie, just be weary. Brewster Park at this time of the year plays very heavy and very slow. You know, so pitches will play that little bit slower this time of year, Shane. Uh, now, Crow Park won't play slow because it's in great condition all year, all year round. So when you get to Crow Park, and you maybe have a, a James McCarthy, or you maybe have, a, 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 off the top of my head, I'm trying to run out names here, but if you had a James McCarthy sitting on, on Morn and breaking forward and causing them serious problems, you probably could cause them from a mobility point of view in the middle third, you could cause them problems, but he's still a class footballer, Shane. He's still a class footballer, and he's still an enormous presence for them. You know, even last year, the final, when they needed to win a kick out, you know, and he won a crucial kick out at a crucial time. And, you know, to have that in your armory and to have that is, is so pivotal. And, it, and it's particularly important uh, when a team presses you to have an out ball like that. You know, it's particularly important. But this time of year, I don't think they get found out that much. And Kerry are going to play Donegal this weekend, a bit of a shootout there. Donegal. Uh, turned over Tyrone at the weekend by four points. Conor McKenna, obviously, his performance really stood out. But what about that Donegal kickout press? That's something that stood out to you. Yeah, the Donegal kickout press. And one of the things, one of the things I looked at was was where they, they sort of they nearly went with with this type of system here, Shane, where you had you had a serious press up front. You had three men. See, the new kickout rules interesting because what the new kickout rule does is the goalkeeper has to kick the ball 13 metres, but he has to kick it from the 21. So you have to be outside the D. So what that meant, what that means now is that teams can more or less police these little areas here. okay? And it actually becomes easier for a team to press. But the other interesting aspect of the kickout, which Niall Morgan likes to do and which, which other keepers like to do, is they like to dink a short kickout and get it back. 
But the new rule now is you can't give the ball directly back to the goalkeeper. So if you're dicking a short kick out into these areas here or these areas here, you're actually putting your defender who's got his back to play, who can't give the ball back to you, you're putting them under fierce pressure. Fierce pressure, you know. But one of the interesting things was, and, and I don't know how much, how relevant it is or how much it works, and they were called out a few times by this, they might, and you hear it more now because there's no supporters shame, they might have roared and squealing and shouting and moving and hands up. I, I don't work it. I don't understand what teams gain out of it. You know, there's a lot of roaring at the goalkeeper, a lot of shouting at the goalkeeper. The Dublin under-20s at the weekend against Jerome were incessant at it. I, I never seen anything like it. You could hear it very clearly on the TV. Donegal was the same. And in fact, when you have a keeper of Niall Morgan's quality or Sean Patton or Stephen Cluxon, it's not going to affect those lads. And in fact, what it does is, if they're roaring and squealing, they're focused on the goalkeeper. They're not focused on the boys who are making little pockets of runs in here and little spaces. And Niall Morgan got a few away. But the difference between Mayo and Galway, Mayo kicked, or Galway goalkeeper kicked ball after ball down the throat of Mayo, Shane. Down the throat of them. But at the weekend when Donegal got the press on and won two or three kickouts, to be fair to Niall Morgan, he disguised a couple then into these pockets here and he got a couple away. And that's a sign of a really good goalkeeper and a really experienced goalkeeper that when you do get the press on, that you find you've got to be brave. You've got to be ballsy. You've got to be brave. You've got to take your chance and you've got to break. You've just got to break the momentum. You've just got to break the momentum, get possession of the ball because kickouts now, Shane, are so important. You, you know, Mayo showed at the weekend the platform, the template it gives you is just so important. If you can get a foothold on the opposition's kickouts, if you can win your own, if you can win your own and disrupt the opposition's kickouts, you are going to win the majority of games that you play. There is no question about it. Yeah, I mean, like, this is this is obviously hurling, but in, in a lot of senses, it's the same. I would have played fullback an awful lot this year, and I would have asked for short puckouts from the goalkeeper because, you know, you want to draw the opposition yeah. team up the field so that the longer ones work. And I had to say, yeah. I disagree on your point about the shouting, does that work? I think if I have someone behind me roaring, it potentially does put me off or make me feel like I'm under more pressure. So I actually do see the upside to that. At least, and like yeah. obviously the hurling rule at the moment allows you to give the ball straight back to the goalkeeper. That did work really well. Like, I mean, that, that's a great advantage to have as a back. It's probably not great for supporters to watch in terms of like encouraging yeah. the press and all that kind of stuff. But from that point of view, I, I can actually see that sort of thing working. And do you think that that's... Like, that's surely a feature that every top team is doing and going to do in this championship. As in the shouting? Yeah, the shouting and roaring and anything they can do to possibly disrupt the yeah, opposition yeah, well, and, well, and make the, them the question. Kind, the counter argument to that is that if you shout at a free taker, the free gets brought in 14 metres. So what's the difference in shouting at a place ball from a goalkeeper? You know, I, look, I, I wouldn't be mad into it. I think if you're roaring and shouting every time there's a kickout, there's 30 kickouts, you're using up a lot of energy. Mm. You're using up a lot of air. You know, I, I don't know if it's, if it's worth it in the end. But uh, yes, I can see, I can understand the, the hands and the hands moving and the visual distraction and the shift in the side to side. But I, I'm not sure, Shane, about the roaring and shouting. But the back pass rule is an interesting one. Because if you go back to soccer as well, you know, the back pass rule changed the game forever. You know, it made it a more entertaining spectacle. I always slag the Liverpool fans uh, because in the 70s, Liverpool went one nil up. And then the back pass the ball to the goalkeeper for 89 minutes. You know, I used to slag the Liverpool boys about that. But the back pass rule, Shane, is an interesting one because it does mean that the defenders under pressure. And it does mean, Shane, that teams that press get rewarded. You know, and I, I felt at the weekend, Tyrone should have been a little bit more, a little bit braver and pressed a few more Donegal kickouts. Now, the other side of it would be that you're looking at it and you're thinking, did Mickey Hart not want to show his hand before the championship? And are they going to go out the championship and go full press? But I was disappointed with Tyrone at the weekend. Uh, I was disappointed in the way they dropped off Donegal. I was disappointed in the lack of of, of intensity in their in their tackling. And, uh, you know, and I thought that they went very very deep at times and allowed Donegal, you know, to grow into the game with some cheap possession, some lateral play. You know, from a tactical point of view, it was a different game than Mayo and Galway. Mayo and Galway looked much more interesting and, and much more open, but. Galway were pathetic, you know, absolutely pathetic, and, and Mayo absolutely obliterated them on kickouts. So it was hard to read into that sort of a game. But Donegal Tyrone was very tactical, particularly in the first half. Uh, you know, it was hugely tactical, and it'll be interesting to see now in the championship what differences there are, there are in the two teams. But I did say in the show last week, Shane, nobody wants to go to Division Two. Nobody wants to go to Division Two, and you've seen the intensity that Mayo played at. Mayo were playing with their lives in the line at the weekend. You know, they, they they clearly wanted it more than Galway. What about uh, just a final point on this Donegal Tyrone game? And you know, looking forward to the weekend. Mayo are going to be against Tyrone, and Donegal they're going to travel to Kerry. 
Conor McKenna, were you impressed with his performance? And like as the game went on, I think plenty of us we were watching where he would play. And at times, especially like he should have had a penalty, I felt in the second half, shouldn't have had one in the first half, got that goal towards the end. Is there a possibility that for like large parts of games, he's now going to actually play the Cahill McShane role? He's a big man, he's speed, he has power. I mean, he has an awful lot of the qualities that make Cahill McShane so good. Yeah, there was uh, there was a big uh, smash on, on Michael Murphy as well in the in the first yeah, half or second yeah. half. I think it was, uh, and, and it's not too many men put Michael Murphy on the ground, but uh, and McKenna actually turned that ball over and poked it forward and, and, and actually won it after that as well. So he's coming back, Shane. Uh, I spoke about him on the show last week. Uh, I made reference to Martin Clark. Uh, Martin coming back from Australia in two thousand and nine, November to or sorry October two thousand and nine. Martin came back. He had one training set with the club I was managing his club at the time uh, and raped and he had one session with us on the Thursday night and he played on the Sunday and he scored 2-4 so uh, I'll never forget that that's true and, and, and I'll be honest to you, he was only on the ball he was only on the ball about 15 times and he was only on the ball for about 2 or 3 seconds at a time you know real real quick hands speed of thought speed of movement but he was in that good a condition that's a game that as I said last week Shane that's entrenched in Conor McKenna that's all he has ever known as a child was Gaelic football you know, I'm sure when he was in Australia, you, you know, physically, from a physical point of view, he's probably ahead of, of all the lads that are on that pitch the other day because he's coming from a professional background. He's training professional sport, you know, and he's coming back. I mean, Martin came back, interesting, Shane. Martin went through a number of years where he would have continued to train as a professional. You know, he would have done his strength conditioning in the morning. He would have done his runs in the evening. You know, yes, he would have been holding down a job on top of that, but he was still training like a professional because it was ingrained in his psyche. And, and Conor McKenna will have that as well. Can he play the Cal McShane role? I don't know. I don't know because playing with your back to goal, close to goal, as an inside forward, is a very unique position to play. And I don't know if that would suit him. I I actually think someone like McKenna, it might suit him in a freer role, like play him at 15 and let him come out and just play his own game. You know, and let him get on the ball, let him put hits in, let him put challenges in, let him break forward, let him set up score, get on the end of things, you know. But playing him at 14, the way teams will play now and, and the spaces you get and the opportunities you get probably won't impact the game as much. And I think it was interesting playing him at 11 because playing him at 11 actually freed him up a little bit more, Shane, and it got him into the game a little bit quicker and kept him involved in the game. 